Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel or if you're new here my name is Kayla otherwise known as Grimlina. I would love to have you hit that red subscribe button down below along with the little bell next to it so that you will get notifications every single time I upload a new video. This is going to be a video that is completely unlike anything I've ever done on my channel before. I've always been very very into true crime, missing persons cases, Jane Doe, John Doe types of cases. I know there's other people that do these types of videos that I'm going to be doing. However, I am going to do my best to do cases um, that I don't see anyone talking about or that there isn't much media coverage on. One of my main motivations for doing these types of videos is to bring awareness to some of these cases that just never really got attention that they deserved. I mean, there's so many cases out there that people are just talking about left and right. I think it's great that those cases are getting around, but it makes me sad for the ones that just don't have the opportunity that a lot of these other more well-known cases have. I would like to kind of contribute to bringing them back into the light and spreading the information out there that I do my research on. I'm going to be doing my absolute best to get the most accurate information on these cases that I can. I'm not trying to do these types of videos intending to disrespect any of the victims or the victims' friends and family members. It's just a topic that I'm passionate about. I know that my channel isn't super big or anything, but it really can't hurt to put this information out there and bring some of these cold cases or cases that never really got the attention they deserve to the light. You never know, someone could come across one of these videos and happen to know something about a case. But today's case that I'm going to be covering is the disappearance of Leah Robert. The more research I did about this case, the more I just racked my brain at what could have happened to this girl. Leah was born in 1976. She was the youngest of three children in her family and they were living in the suburbs of Durham, North Carolina. So when she was 17, her father was diagnosed with a chronic lung disease and that alone put a lot of strain on the entire family and around that time she was preparing to start her studies at the University of North Carolina in Raleigh, North Carolina in 1995. So starting college is already stressful enough. Tack on your dad being diagnosed with a severe life-threatening chronic lung disease is just a double whammy. Only a few years later when Leah was 20 years old and a sophomore in college, her mother ended up passing away very suddenly from some sort of heart disease. So understandably, when her mother passed away so suddenly, she ended up taking a little bit of time off of school and she didn't start back to college until the fall of 1998. And in between the time that her mother passed and the time that she went back to college, she ended up being being hospitalized because she was in a very, very serious car accident. She ended up having a punctured lung and a completely shattered femur, which is the bone that's in the thigh of the leg. The surgeons actually had to insert a metal rod into that bone so that it could heal back correctly. Sometime after the accident, she ended up telling her older sister, Kara, that she remembered that when she saw the truck that she hit pull out in front of her, she was positive that she was going to die and that after her recovery, she ended up being quote unquote born again. And while she was taking some time off from college, she did a lot of soul searching and thinking. She decided that she wanted to live her life to the fullest because she kind of felt like she had a second chance at life and she wanted to make the most of it. So like I said, she went back to school in the fall of 1998. And if that wasn't enough bad things to happen to one person, just that Next spring in 1999, she was actually scheduled to go to Costa Rica and about three-ish weeks before she was supposed to leave to go there, her father ended up passing away. So she ended up losing both of her parents in her early 20s, which I can't imagine how horrible that would be. But despite her dad passing away, she still continued to go to school and pursue her degrees. And another thing to note is that since she no longer had any living parents and she was going to be going out of the country for a while, Leah ended up granting her older sister Kara power of attorney over her bank accounts. The money that she inherited from her parents had been deposited into those accounts. So when Leah was in her senior year of college, like just on the brink of completing her degree 
in Spanish and anthropology, she ended up dropping out of college. She literally had only six more months to go of school and she dropped out and her older sister and brother tried their best to convince her to just stick it out and just get through the next six months just so that you can get the degree that you've been working so hard for. But that wasn't enough to get her to change her mind. She still dropped out of college six months before she was supposed to graduate. After she had dropped out of college, she ended up taking up a few hobbies, which was learning to play the guitar and she also got into photography. She also ended up getting a kitten that she named Bee. And amongst those things, she also started hanging out at a local coffee house called Cup of Joe. On the morning of March 9th, 2000. Leah had actually talked on the phone with her older sister Kara about her future plans that she had laid out for herself. That that particular call ended with them understanding that they would be seeing each other in the near future. So later on that day in the early afternoon, Leah and her roommate Nicole actually decided to do some babysitting the following day. After they kind of made plans to do the babysitting, her roommate Nicole went on to her work like usual and then when she returned home later that day, she noticed that Leah's white 1993 Jeep Cherokee was not there and Leah also was not there at their residence. At the time, her roommate didn't really think anything of it because she was kind of used to Leah being gone and coming back at unknown and random intervals of time and since she had dropped out of school she had just been living off of her parents inheritance for the time being so she had no need to go to any kind of job or anything so her roommate just went on and did her regular thing the next day Leah never showed up to the appointment that they had to babysit and she also never showed up at, by the end of the following day either so that was when her roommate was kind of alarmed by not seeing her all day and her not showing up or calling or anything about the babysitting appointment. So the following day after that, Leah still had not showed up at all. And on that day, she had friends and family calling looking for Leah because apparently some of her family and friends had planned to see Leah during that time or something and then she didn't show up. That's when her roommate really got alarmed. So that following Monday, which was March 13th, her roommate Nicole ended up reporting Leah missing. So the day after that Monday that they reported her missing, Leah's roommate Nicole and her older sister Kara ended up going and searching through her room to look for any kind of clues or indications as to why she had been absent for the last several days. They did end up discovering that like a majority of her clothes were missing. So that suggested to them that she had planned to leave for a lengthy amount of time. Her kitten was not around at all. The cat carrier was gone, so it obviously appeared that she had also taken her cat with her. So unfortunately, my camera cut out some pretty significant parts, so I'm gonna have to do a voiceover for this. But upon searching Leah's room, they also found that she had left a note on her dresser, and one part that she wrote in it said, I'm not suicidal, I'm the opposite. And she was reassuring her sister and her friends that everything was fine with her. She even mentioned Jack Kerouac, basically confirming that her trip was inspired by his books like she had talked about with her friends before. I'm gonna leave a link in the description below that tells more details about Jack Kerouac and his books, which is quite interesting. No that Leah was so deeply into his work. And along with the note, she also left a bundle of cash, which was about a month's worth of her share of the rent. And she suggested that she would eventually be coming back home. Although I wasn't able to find a photo of the note in its entirety, I heard that the note was rather jumbled. And I kind of wonder if Leah was maybe having some sort of mental breakdown. And with all that she had been through, I really don't think that it's far-fetched. Anyways, the note was illustrated with a drawing of the Cheshire Cat's grin, as she was a big fan of Alice in Wonderland. But I feel that she intended for the drawing to have a deeper meaning behind it with how the Cheser cat is here and then it's gone and then he reappears and even her sister said that she got a creepy feeling from that drawing. And I also wanted to mention that Kara saw that Leah had withdrawn around $3,000 from her bank account just before she took off on her trip which will be significant later on in the video. So there were um, several transactions after where she saw her pay for the motel room in Tennessee that showed her like buying gas and food in different locations which suggested that Leah was traveling along Interstate 40 and then when she reached the end of Interstate 40 in California she began traveling north on Interstate 5. The last transaction that she saw were that she had bought gas on March 13th in Brooks, Oregon and all activity on her bank accounts after that purchase of gas ended. There was no more 
activity at all. So I'm sure they assumed that she was using the cash as well to pay for things. So the activity ending there wasn't initially like super alarming to them. So after she had looked at all of her financial records, Kara and Leah's best friend, Susie Smith, ended up going to the local coffee house that Leah had been going to in hopes to be able to understand why Leah was traveling to the Pacific Northwest. And when they went to the coffee house, they ended up running into Janine Quiller. That was one of her friends. She said they both had been struck by the 1958 novel, The Dharma Bums, which was a sequel to the book On the Road. And in the Dharma Bums novel and possibly the entire sequel of those books, the author actually talked about his time as a U.S. Forest Service fire lookout in the Northern Cascade Mountains in Washington. He also talked about how he was profoundly affected by all of the landscape and the beauty of the wilderness and nature. So those novels really inspired Leah to express interest in wanting to visit that particular area. So after they kind of discovered that at the coffee shop, that kind of calmed her sister Kara's fears and it just kind of gave her a sense of relief that she kind of found her sister's objective for why she did this and why she left. At the time, Kara really didn't have any reason to think that something bad had happened and they just went on about living their life until March 18th, which was just a few days later. Leah's sister Kara was absolutely 100% expecting her sister to call her on her 26th birthday. However, she did not receive any call that day from Leah. So instead of receiving a happy birthday call from her sister Leah, she unfortunately received a note from the Durham County Sheriff's Office. And the note was just basically telling her to call one of their counterparts in the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office all the way in Bellingham, Washington. So after she made that call, Kara ended up finding out that her sister's Jeep Cherokee was found in a very remote forest earlier that day. Unfortunately, Leah was nowhere around and it was just her Jeep. So all the way in Washington, early that morning of March 18th, there was a couple that was jogging on Canyon Creek Road, which was a side route of Mount Baker Highway. The area was very, um, isolated. There was only a select few houses in the area and there was also some logging camps. This particular area was super super close to the Canadian border. So as they were jogging along they noticed on a really tight curve at the top of a slope some articles of clothing lying on the side of the road and strangely enough there was also some pieces of clothing that had been tied to some of the trees and branches that were on the side of the road. So after they discovered that in the woods right below there in a very steep embankment, they found Leah's Jeep Cherokee, which was very severely damaged. So obviously when they discovered this, they immediately called the police and had them come out and investigate this accident scene. So apparently from the path that the Jeep took through the trees and the extent of the damage of the Jeep and the trees that it plowed through, they were able to determine that the car was going about 40 miles per hour when it went off the side of the road and down the embankment. And everything that was in the Jeep had been majorly tossed around and even tossed out of the Jeep, which suggested that it had rolled over multiple times. But the very bizarre thing about this is they were not able to find any evidence that there was anyone in the car. They weren't able to find a drop of blood anywhere. There was no like shatter parts on the windshield where they might have hit their head or something. The seat belts weren't stretched or anything. Those are just things that you would expect to see in a crash like that if there were people actually in the car when it crashed. All of that kind of suggested that this crash might have been staged or planned and there wasn't actually any occupant in the car at all when it went off of the embankment. But another very bizarre thing about this scene was that there were blankets and pillows from inside the car that had been tied onto the windows where the glass had been shattered out. That kind of suggested that there had been someone using the Jeep as shelter or something after it had crashed. They were also able to find some of Leah's belongings scattered throughout the woods. They found her passport, her checkbook, her driver's license, her guitar, clothes, her CDs, and several other things. They also found like bits of cat food and they found the cat carrier suggesting that she did indeed take her kitten B with her, but to this day the cat has never been found either. They also discovered a pair of pants that had $2,500 in one of the pockets. They also found like valuable jewelry. So since they found a considerable amount of cash and valuable things scattered around the scene, they pretty much ruled out that this was some sort of robbery. But shortly after they found her Jeep, Leah's older sister 
Kara and her brother Heath took matters into their own hands and they decided to travel out to Bellingham, Washington to assist in the investigation. They also found amongst Leah's belongings at the scene a box of like mementos that she had from her trip. One of the things in the box was actually a ticket stub which was a showing for the movie American Beauty in the theaters in the Bellingham Bellis Fair shopping mall. I believe that the showing time for the movie was like 2 p.m., something like that. So once they discovered this ticket stub and that she had possibly went to this theater in this shopping mall, her brother and sister actually saw a sit-down restaurant in the mall. And I believe it was the only sit-down restaurant in that shopping mall. They just felt like it was a restaurant that Leah would have gone to to get something to eat. But once they did this, it actually led police to two different customers, both of which were men, who not only remembered Leah being there that day, but they claimed that they had also sat on either side of her at the counter. And they said that she was talking with them about Jack Kerouac and her plans of how she wanted to imitate what she had read in the books, which in my opinion was not a good idea on her part if she did that because telling some guys that you have no clue who they are, that you're traveling on the other side of the country alone, that is dangerous to say the least, no matter how nice the people seem to be. I don't think it's a good idea to tell them what your plans are or anything like that. However, the second guy that they had questioned um, ended up saying that Leah had left with a third guy and he said that she called him by the name of Barry and he actually provided a very very detailed description of this Barry guy but the strange part about this is that none of the other customers or other employees or even the other guy that sat next to Leah that day said that they never saw this Barry guy that she supposedly left with so they weren't able to back this guy's claims up so of course they ended up towing Leah's Jeep Cherokee to a police garage where they continued to kind of investigate the vehicle and they were also joined by the FBI. There were two aspects of the evidence that they discovered that suggested that Leah had been a victim of some sort of crime. The first being that the amount of money that they found in one of the pockets of her pants suggested that she had not spent even close to the amount of money that she would have needed to stay in Bellingham for several days. And the second aspect is the fact that they found Leah's mother's engagement ring under one of the floor mats, which she constantly wore. Her friends and family in North Carolina claimed that she would never voluntarily take that ring off because of the sentimental connection that it had to her mother that had passed, unless she had just completely forgotten who she was. So after all this, her brother and sister returned back to North Carolina after having been out there for about four days. When they arrived back home, they had been kind of working up this theory that Leah might have been like badly injured in the accident and might have had some sort of head injury where she had amnesia and just kind of like wandered off. So that um, caused the police to spend about two weeks in April of doing a very thorough ground search with dogs and helicopters where they covered a very large area of where they think she would have been able to wander off to and they did not find anything whatsoever. Another thing is that they decided to check the security camera footage from the gas station in Brooks, Oregon. They did see her on the camera footage and she was standing in line. She looked to be in good condition. There was nothing really out of the ordinary. The only thing is while she was standing in line to pay, she did kind of keep peering out the door towards the parking lot. Unfortunately, there was not any kind of security cameras on the parking lot area so they weren't able to look and see what she might have been looking at, if there was somebody out there or if she was in trouble or something like that. They did kind of think that her um, peering out repeatedly might have suggested that she had someone with her, possibly this Barry guy. However, if this Barry guy was with her at this gas station, the police don't think that he ever traveled in the Jeep with her, that he might have been in a separate car. So a few days after Leah's Jeep was discovered, an anonymous man called in to report a sighting of Leah and he had claimed that his wife had saw her like looking really confused and possibly disoriented at a gas station somewhere in Everett which was pretty close to Seattle, Washington. After he had told them that he started to become really nervous and he just hung up without identifying him or his wife. However, the police did consider this tip credible and it might have been the last known sighting of Leah. So after the initial investigation, Leah's sister Kara um, 
um, told the police to just keep her Jeep in case there were like other clues that were to pop up years down the road. And it's a very good thing that she did because later on in 2006, they were able to use it to get a little bit more evidence. The detective that was assigned to Leah Roberts' case initially had retired the new detective that was assigned to the case, Mark Joseph. He ended up noticing when he was looking through the files of Leah's case that the car and the contents inside of it had not been fully processed, which is insane to me. Like, why would it not be fully processed? You should turn that Jeep inside out trying to get any and all information that you could possibly get as to what the heck might have happened. So Mark Joseph and another young detective ended up finishing their job. Believe it or not, no one had ever looked under the hood of the Jeep. So they ended up prying open the hood. Another really bizarre thing to me is that I read in several places that the wire to the starter relayer was cut in the Jeep, but then on other places I read that the cover to the starter relay had been removed, and I'm not really sure which one of those is true. However, the police claimed that would make it possible to turn the key on and push the starter relay and have the Jeep accelerate on its own. I'm not super knowledgeable in mechanics, so I'm sort of confused on whether that is possible or not. Either way, that level of tampering would require the knowledge of an experienced mechanic, which the guy number two at the restaurant had that type of background, whether it's a coincidence or not. I was thinking that it might have been possible that someone was driving it at the 30 to 40 mile per hour rate and maybe bailed out of the car before it went off the embankment, which would still probably mean the crash was staged. From my understanding, that kind of tampering with the Jeep would only cause the Jeep to not be able to start up. If you have any knowledge on this particular part, please let me know down in the comments on this particular part of the case. They also found a male fingerprint under the hood and also some male DNA on an article of Leah's clothing. And so this led them back to this guy in the Bellis Bear restaurant. Keep in mind, this second guy was the only one that saw this Barry dude. This guy had also worked as a mechanic and he did have a military background. He had moved to Canada for whatever reason. In 2011, it came back that the fingerprint they found under the hood was not a match to this guy, but they were still waiting on the results of the DNA sample. The detectives that are on this case continue to believe that evidence that they have found so far will hopefully lead eventually to a resolution to this case, even though they have done repeat searches of the area with using dogs and they also were using metal detectors because she did have that metal rod in the femur of her leg. So that would have been a surefire way to identify her body if she were to be found, but nothing new ever came from all those searches. The police and the investigators on this case, from my understanding, believe that Leah was a victim of foul play, but the evidence that they have found uh, definitely suggests a variety of theories. No one can be 100% sure of whether she is dead or alive today. So that is pretty much the information that I was able to find. This case has just like blown my mind and it's just so bizarre to me. Leah seemed to be a pretty carefree type of girl and might have been a little bit too trusting of people and too willing to tell strangers that she might have run into her plans, what she was doing, you know, a young female traveling alone across the country, far away from home. I feel like someone might have noticed that and taken advantage of that, unfortunately. And even though the blankets and stuff on the windows hanging up looking like someone might have been using it as a shelter or something that might have been part of the staging of it. That is unfortunately the theory that I'm leaning towards the most. It has been 17 years since she disappeared. I just really sincerely hope that one day her family is able to obtain justice for what happened to their sister and I just can't imagine the pain that they've had to deal with with losing both of their parents and their sister. I send all of my love to her family, her sister, her brother, her friends, anyone that knew her and I just really hope that they are somehow able to solve this case eventually and help bring closure to her family. And there are people out there that think she might have staged this herself and used it as a way to just like run away and start a new life for herself under a different identity or something. Anything is possible. I wish I was able to find a little bit more information on this guy that had described this Barry dude that she left with. He's 
innocent until proven guilty, but you can't help but wonder if this guy really is somehow connected to her disappearance. It might be possible that he made up this description of this guy that he claimed that she left with to throw the attention away from him, even though the fingerprint wasn't a match. I never was able to find anything on the DNA that was found on her clothing of whether that was a match or not. I assume that it wasn't because I feel like I would have been able to find something on it. There's just this gut feeling that this guy at least knows more than he claims to know. And like I said, I'm not saying he's guilty. He could be completely innocent, but that is just my feelings on the case. I feel like she was planning to disappear for a while and eventually come back. But I feel like if that was the case that she wasn't able to come back because she met with foul play of some sort. I've never really found any kind of further information on the cat and the cat carrier that they found and stuff. So that's another thing that really stands out to me as super bizarre. It's just so confusing. It almost sounds like someone purposely did all of these crazy things to throw the police off, like with all the blankets hanging on the car and the clothes tied to the trees. And I did see that some people think Leah might have been suicidal and just didn't want her loved ones to know and worry about that. But I really just don't feel she would have done something like that to her brother and sister, especially after they had already suffered the loss of both of their parents. I really don't even think she would have staged her own disappearance and started a new life because again that would mean her siblings would be suffering with yet another loss if she is alive out there somewhere. The only theory that I think is like even logical is that she was actually in the jeep when it crashed and sustained a head injury of some sort that caused amnesia or caused her to forget who she was and she could be out there living a completely different life not even knowing who she is. But even that theory I feel isn't really a strong possibility in my personal opinion. Opinion, but again that possibility can't really be ruled out. If there was any info in this video that I was wrong about or if there's any information on this case that I failed to include in this video please feel free to leave that in the comments down below. I welcome any kind of extra information you can bring in on this case. I'm very interested in hearing your theories or your thoughts on this case. If someone out there happens to be watching this video or has stumbled upon this case and you have any information or any tips that you could possibly provide the investigators with, I will be leaving a number that you can call down below. I'm pretty sure um, you can make it anonymous if you don't want to like identify yourself. You never know what small little thing might lead to solving a case. Once again, my heart goes out to Leah's family members. If you've made it to the end of this video, thank you so, so much for taking the time out of your day to watch. If you found this video interesting or you are excited about this new series I'm doing on my channel, definitely give this video a big thumbs up. It also really helps get my videos exposure and and I feel like that's super important in these particular types of videos. I hope you are having a wonderful day or wonderful night wherever you are. And I will see you all in my next video.